50 things about his daddy. His daddy was Elmo Zumwalt. He was valedictorian of his high school class in California. Then he went to Naval Academy, graduated in 42. He was the Battle of Lady Gough. Lady Gough was the biggest naval battle ever that the Navy has ever seen. He was in the Battle of Lady Gough at a very young age. He then uh, did a lot of different things in the Navy. Uh, uh, he was the boss man from 70 to 74, and he had challenges about what ships to make and what ships not to make. And Zoom, there was a guy named Hyman Rickover. He wanted mostly submarines. And his dad saw the importance of surface ships, not big surface ships, where uh, Hyman sort of think about big ships and submarines in the middle type of ships. But his dad understood the wisdom of having destroyers and other things. That's the ship named after his dad. It's a very, was christened, I think, in 2016. It was the first of its class. I think it's called the Zumwalt class, but this is very advanced. He'll speak a little bit about that. But his dad, after, you know, he retired age 53 as the highest admiral you can have in the Navy. And men like that don't retire. And he did multiple things. I'll just say the things he did for medicine. We've got a few doctors here. But he did help with bone marrow transplants, started the, what you call MUD, M-U-D, Match Unrelated Donor Program in 19. 86 to 88 when his his sister was transplant donor for his brother a lot of people don't have donors so his dad was the first chairman of that um, his dad there was a LAVA hospital it's named uh, uh, it's named partly after him for mesothelioma mesotheliomas are common problems in men on ships and people tearing down asbestos things in the world so his dad actually died of mesothelioma and they have a research center at the LA VA and the LA VA is uh, named mesothelioma research center after his dad um, and he's going to talk a little about Agent Orange about his dad helped a lot of our veterans get things they deserve from that exposure so I don't want to steal the show but I think you need a little bit of introduction we have two of his books. This is James's books, one on his dad and his brother, looking up in the area morning. And this is the one about Vietnam. He's got a few other ones. He's written articles in 200 different uh, world-class magazines. So we're lucky to have this man talk about Vietnam. I heard him at lunch talk about his dad and excellent speaker. So, uh, uh, and we'll have time for questions and answers afterwards. So we'll start thinking about good questions and he will answer them. Thank you. James C. Z. Hall, Lieutenant Colonel, Thank you, Mark. Um, I come from a family with a rich military tradition. And, uh, we had Jacobs on Malt who served in the Revolutionary War, and uh, we had a member of the family just about every conflict that America was fought. Uh, my own son was, after 9-11, uh, volunteered for the NRTC program at Tulane University and uh, was accepted uh, to the NRTC program. Partway through the program, he had to decide whether he wanted to go Navy like his granddad or Marine like his dad. So I was intrigued to see what his decision would be. He called me up and said, Dad, I'd be Dean's list. And I said, that's terrific, son. I'm proud of him. He said, yeah, but now I think I'm too smart to be a Marine. <laughs> I don't want any of you Navy and Army guys using that material. <laughs> the, uh, the book I wrote about the Vietnam War, Bare Feet, Iron Mill, uh, was, uh, is based on interviews I did with a couple of hundred North Vietnamese and Viet Cong veterans. It, uh, I made over 50 trips back to Vietnam after the war to do those interviews. <clears throat> when I initially wrote the book, some of my fellow veterans uh, uh, made the statement that they, they thought that I was trying to glamorize the enemy. I was not trying to glamorize the enemy, I was trying to humanize it. And my experiences over there during those 50 trips uh, gave me that desire to humanize the war effort. And let me explain how that came about. Um, during the war, my father commanded the uh, forces, naval forces in Vietnam. 
and uh, the uh, about the Navy, uh, groundwater Navy, to go out on, on uh, pretty aggressive patrolling. As a result, these boats were operating in fair, fairly narrow waterways, and because of the heavy vegetation on the banks, the enemy could set up an ambush, and the boat would be in the middle of an ambush before they knew what happened. The casualty rate, if you served a 12-month tour in Vietnam in the groundwater Navy, was 72%. A 72% chance of being killed or wounded. My father learned that Agent Orange had been used by the Army to clear some of the vegetation around their fire bases, and so he had his staff check the chemical companies to make sure there were no adverse human effects. He was told there were not, and so he started using it on the riverbanks in Vietnam. And if you've ever seen pictures of uh, those defoliated riverbanks, you see the vegetation stripped off these, these uh, trees for about 100 yards on either side. The casualty rate dropped from 72% to 6%. So from a military standpoint, it, uh, it was a smart decision. Tragically, we did not know that many of our veterans would come home at the time of tick bomb, uh, a ticking time bomb, uh, and that they would uh, come down with various cancers that uh, were related to exposure to Agent Orange. My brother served as a swift boat commander in Vietnam under my father's command. He returned from the war in 1970, married, raised the family, and in uh, 1985, he was diagnosed with lymphoma. And when you have lymphoma, you have one, two kinds of lymphoma, either Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He was uh, one of maybe a dozen medical cases that had both. And again, uh, my father strongly felt this was related to his exposure to Agent Orange. The, uh, the more he got in, into it, my, my brother unfortunately passed away in 1988. And my father uh, uh, immediately threw himself into the Asian Orange issue. I, I, I discovered when you're hit with a tragedy in life, there's two roads you can take. One is the high road, you do something positive. One is the low road, you do uh, something negative and you feel sorry for yourself. My father took the high road, threw himself into the Asian Orange issue. I took the low road and became very embittered about the war and the enemy we fought there. In 1994, my father had uh, arranged to meet with the president of Vietnam to see if he could uh, get his agreement to do a joint study on Agent Orange and asked me if I wanted to go with him. Initially, I did not. I decided I would go. We went over there for about a week, and as I sat across the table from veterans who fought on the other side of the battlefield, I felt the anger building up inside me. And about the third day, I had a meeting with them. They, uh, Major General who had been in the North Vietnamese Army, he started the meeting by extending his condolences to the loss of my brother. We started talking about the war and its impact, and as we did, I saw him get a little teary-eyed. And I later learned that he too had lost a brother in that war. And when he shared that with me, it was kind of like a light went on, and I asked myself, was there any difference uh, because of the side of the battlefield you were on? The impact was the same. He had lost a brother, I had lost a brother. At least in my case, I was with my brother when he died. I knew where he died and how he died. I knew the, uh, where he was being buried. This general spent 17 years looking for his uh, uh, brother's remains. And it's very important, it was very important in the Vietnamese culture that when someone dies, they return to the village of birth because the the uh, soul passes to the soil, the soil nurtures the crops, and the surviving family members consume the crops. So it's a continuation of the cycle of life. He said he found the remains after 17 years, but Vietnam didn't have the capability of doing the DNA, DNA testing that we could. So, you know, it was kind of questionable whether or not he really found the, uh, the remains. But at least it brought him some closure feeling that he had uh, found the remains. But as I said, that, that turned on a light for me, and I realized that there was a concept I had lost all sight of, and it's something I call universality. There's a universal impact when a war occurs. It hits both sides of the tragedy, and I came to accept in 1994 that uh, that tragedy had been visited upon 
the other side of the battlefield. It was at that point I committed myself to making trips back and interviewing hundreds of their veterans to get a better grasp of what the war was like from their standpoint. And so I'm going to focus on uh, uh, a lot of that in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, the, the first section of the book that I wrote deals with uh, uh, medicine and the, uh, the doctors, the way they had to handle battlefield injuries uh, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. I uh, was uh, introduced to a Dr. Lee Cal Dai. In 1966, Dr. Dai was 37 years old. He was ordered to form a field hospital, about 400 staff, and to take it down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to uh, uh, provide medical care for soldiers on the battlefields in the south. His wife asked him when he would be back. He said, I'll probably be back in about a year. She didn't see him for eight years. He spent eight years down in uh, the southern battlefields. As you, many of you know, our tours were, were much shorter, 12 to 13 months. So uh, that was quite a, quite a commitment. But he uh, shared with me, he said, on the, when he formed this hospital and he went down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they were bombed repeatedly by US aircraft. So by the time they got down south, they were basically a field hospital in name only. They, uh, they had lost a lot of their medical supplies, and so they needed to uh, uh, you know, find more medical equipment that they could use, and they found the interesting uh, party to replace that, the U.S. government. And this is what they would do. At night, we were dropping pipe flares to observe activity on the battlefield. The next day, Dr. Dye would send his soldiers out to collect these uh, parachutes. They used the parachute itself as a bandage. They would use the, the lines of the parachute as sutures. They could even use the container that contained the uh, uh, um, the, the flare as a, a stethoscope. They uh, also would uh, scour the area for, for uh, aircraft that had crashed. They would grab the piping, they would cut it in sections, and then cut it in half so it could be used as a brace for a broken bone. They uh, would take the wire the, and uh, pull that out. They'd take the wire out and leave the, the rubber as an IV tube. They would, uh, uh, Mother Nature helped out too. They, they would uh, collect coconuts. Coconuts could be used as a uh, container for the IV fluid and they would stick that rubber tube up the bottom of the, of the coconut. The uh, uh, surgical tools, they, uh, they would uh, find explosives that had detonated, they would collect the metal and they could forge these down into surgical tools. The uh, uh, soda and beer bottles, they would melt those down and use them for vials for the medicine. Nothing went to waste. One of the problems they had was in doing surgery and they didn't do their surgery in an above ground facility, everything was done underground. Uh, so they had operating rooms underground. And a lot of time they had generators, but they didn't have sufficient food, uh, su su sufficient fuel for the generator. So they would have the bicycle hooked up to the generator, and soldiers would take turns pedaling the bicycle during surgery uh, to provide the, uh, uh, the juice for the, uh, the electronics that they were using. One other thing I found interesting was they uh, became very friendly with uh, the natives in the jungle. And uh, they found out that the natives had medical solutions for some things that they didn't realize. Malaria was a major problem. Uh, they were losing a lot of troops to malaria. And they discovered in talking to the natives that there was a concoction you could make using a particular worm that was in the, uh, uh, in the Vietnam jungles that you mash up and then mix with these other items and it uh, had a medicinal uh, function in, uh, in 
help him with malaria. They started using that. Dr. Dye said years after the war, he read in, the, in a French medical journal uh, where this, we had finally recognized the fact that here was a, uh, a worm that could be used for medicinal purposes. So it was interesting that the, the natives in the jungles of Vietnam had been using it probably for 100 years before we became aware of it. It was difficult for them to maintain uh, medical records on their people because they had limited uh, supplies for writing them. And what they would do is they would uh, take uh, bamboo trees, again, they would cut the tree uh, into sections and uh, cut it, uh, splice it in half, put a string on it, and then put the string around the patient's neck and write on the inside of the bamboo what his medical status was so that it could be followed uh, uh, from doctor to doctor. Ingenuity was, was, was unlimited. Another problem was food shortage, although they they had a 400-man staff. They would uh, have about 1,000 patients that they had to take care of. And again, keep in mind that these were not above-ground facilities. They were having to dig underground uh, facilities for their patients. And, you know, it, it, Dr. Dye said that uh, it took him almost a day to go from one end of the complex to the other because of how spread out they were uh, with those uh, underground facilities. He said that uh, they usually had enough rice and, and food to uh, feed the patients, but occasionally they would have to go out on hunting parties. And uh, they would send the hunting parties out to, to uh, gather fish. Uh, they, they would uh, shoot elephants. He said, uh, first time we shot an elephant, and uh, we were excited about doing it, but then we tried cutting it open and uh, had a hard time doing it. So one of the surgeons suggested you go through the belly of the beast where the, the, the skin was the thinnest. And he, he described cutting into the belly of the, of the elephant and scooping out the meat from the inside out. Um, again, just you know, conditions that we couldn't dream of that they were going through as a, as a, a way of life. Um, he said, uh, quote, the first time talking about this elephant, it was almost impossible to cut through the meat of the elephant due to its thick hide, so my surgeon suggested it might be best to cut the elephant's belly open, then step inside the belly and cut the meat from the inside out. My surgeon actually stood inside the elephant's belly with blood up to his ankles, cutting away. In case you're ever interested, he said that the best parts were the trunk and the palms of the feet. So if you're ever at a restaurant that serves them. <laughs> he described their discovery of the grizzly site one day. He said, quote, we stumbled upon a, a helicopter crash site in 1970. Searching the wreckage for salvageable materials, we found the skeletal remains of six to seven occupants. We estimated from the jungle over overgrowth and the state of some remains of the helicopter crash a year or two earlier. Teeth marks on some bones and the scattering of remains about the crash site suggested the bodies were long ago, ra long ago ravaged by wild animals. The watch was now hanging from the wrist bone of the skeleton inside the aircraft, a seco. Removing the watch from a skeletal caretaker, a member of our party gently shook it. As he did so, it immediately began to tip. Perhaps as a gentle reminder to those of us in the hunting party that time marches on for those of this life long after the dead have departed for another. He uh, described uh, the situation one day when they were conducting an operation uh, underground. And uh, he said, quote, one afternoon in 1969, I started an operation in a bunker assisted by another doctor. When an air attack began, we had to move our patient to a, uh, in, in this case, they were a bunker now, and they had, they had to move the patient underground. IVs and other equipment were disconnected. The patient was carried through a small tunnel and into the underground shelter. All the while, I kept my hands in my gloves and did not touch anything. Once inside the underground bunker, I continued my surgery. As I finished the operation, bombs were dropped, destroying the above-ground bunker for where I had started the operation. Unquote. He also reported that the armies of the two-legged kind, armies of, can anybody, everybody hear me? Am I, 
Yeah. But you can't hear, raise your hand. I'll, I'll adjust the mic. I guess there's some feedback on this. Uh, you said that they not only had to look out for armies of the two-legged kind um, and uh, in sharing the following. He said, well, there were lots of insects, terrible insects in the jungle. Sometimes we came across millions of ticks. They bit you when you pulled them off, but the head remained in your skin. Sometimes we saw the ticks in long columns moving through the jungle. They were all around. If we stopped for a short time to remove them, others started taking their place. So we moved very quickly through the tick-infested areas and tried to find a nearby stream of light. We found ticks did not like water. We went into the water and did not have to worry about them. In the water, we only had to worry about the leeches and snakes. The uh, treatment of, of wounds became another issue for them. Quote, originally we closed all wounds, but later found that we did so, the wound tended to get infected, so we would leave the wound open. We also found the same was true in case of an arterial wound. If we tried to sew it up and restore the artery, it most assuredly got infected. So we found the best treatment was to close both ends of the artery on either side of the wound, leaving the wound open. In doing this, we made a very interesting discovery about our people. Due to all the walking our soldiers were doing to the jungles, they, in many cases, were developing collateral circulation, which provided an alternative and ample blood, uh, blood supply through the effective limb. Unquote. The, uh, you, the different types of weapons that we used in Vietnam created some diagnostic problems for the doctors. Um, and one weapon in, in particular, the uh, uh, CVU, uh, which consisted of uh, 305.5 millimeter diameter pellets and would uh, explode and, and spread all these pellets in different directions. Uh, one doctor reported, quote, the pellet left an almost indiscernible entry exit wound on the victim's body. Without a wound clearly visible, it was very difficult for the treating surgeon to make a diagnosis. This was compounded when the wound was a cranial one, as often the pellet pierced on one side of the cranium. The, moment, the momentum of the pellet was similar to that of the billiard ball. The pellet was repeatedly ricocheted within the cranial cavity before finally coming to rest inside. We studied this problem for several months before finding a simple solution. We learned to squeeze the victim's skin to see if blood or air came out. In this way, one could immediately recognize where the entry hole was." Unquote. Uh, I met another doctor, uh, Dr. Tan, who was uh, one of the world's leading authorities on the most unique but uh, psychological, psychologically devastating combat one. He became a, a pioneer in the field of male organ reconstructive surgery. Quote, during the war, I developed a significant specialty in this area because there were so many cases of combat wounds in which the male reproductive organ had been severed. I spent many months studying the matter. After doing so, I surgically reconstructed the organ and other parts of the genitalia. This included not only cosmetic but functional restoration, so later the victim could have uh, children normal. We built, rebuilt the organ by taking material from the abdominal wall. We transferred nerves from the forearm, the so-called Chinese forearm flap. The abdominal material and nerves were then transplanted to the affected area. We implanted cartilage into it to restore not only the form but the function. Afterwards, these patients can enjoy normal sex life. After the war, microsurgery made this operation much easier to perform. Unquote. Another doctor I met, Dr. Lee. Uh, to look at him, you would have thought that he was a ardent uh, combat infantry soldier. He had been wounded six times by not only the French, but the Americans. And most notably, he was missing part of his right hand. However, I learned that Dr. Lee was a brain surgeon. And uh, he had uh, operated on many of those who uh, came to him with uh, those kinds of wounds. He said, well, in many cases, we lacked anesthesia. But due to the seriousness of the patient's wounds, we did not delay surgery. On occasion, this included brain surgery. Sometimes, novocaine was available to deaden the initial cut through the scalp. After cutting through the scalp, the problem was in trying to cut through the skull to operate in the brain. 
to do this, several holes were drilled into the skull. The patient would have to be held down until he fell unconscious. Normally, a special surgical drill was used to limit penetration by the drill bit to prevent accidental puncture of the brain. As we had no such drill, we were forced to use a regular hand drill, thus running the constant risk of damaging the brain during surgery. The skull has two layers, one white in color and the other pink. The surgeon had to know how deep to drill. We relied on previous experience to determine exactly how far to drill based on our knowledge of layer thickness. After drilling a series of holes in a circular pattern, we inserted a coarse wire down through one hole and up through the next, grabbing the two limbs and pulling back and forth in a seesaw-like manner to slice through the skull bone in between. This procedure was repeated between each set of holes as pieces of the skull bone were chipped away, exposing the brain underneath. By the end of the surgery, there was really a, a, barely a large enough piece of skull bone to fit back into the skull as a missing section of section bone came out in these pieces. We, we had to leave the hole in the skull and just sew the scalp flat back over it. After doing so, one could actually see the scalp over the open part of the skull bone palpitating, much like a heart beating. Such patients required additional surgery later to insert a metal plate over the hole to protect the still exposed brain. We were constantly forced to come up with creative ways to treat the wound. We were much like the treatment, uh, it was much like the treatments of the Egyptians thousands of years earlier, such as having an amputee briefly put his bleeding stump into boiling water to stop the flow of blood. While medical conditions for us during the war were horrendous, it was a price we had to pay for victory. The war was a lot like a chess match. And nowhere was that more obvious than on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was a misnomer, actually, because it wasn't a single trail. It was a network of primarily seven to, to uh, nine north-south roads and dozens of east-west roads. And when we discovered uh, a section of the road and started looking for convoys in the bomb, but they were simply shipped over to another road to continue the transit on down uh, south. They said about the, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, quote, you cannot openly hide a road that is visible, but if you make that road invisible, you can hide it in the open. And what they meant by that was they did a tremendous job where they could of disguising uh, where the road was. Uh, it involved, in some cases, replanting trees to cover a road section that had to go through an open area. Uh, it, uh, it involved them uh, in, in crossing rivers. We knew they had to be crossing rivers at certain points, and so we would obviously look for bridges. And we would find a bridge and we'd bomb it, go home happy that we had disrupted the logistical flow. What we didn't realize was that a lot of these bridges they built were decoy bridges simply for us to have a target to knock down. And they came up with a series of ways of, uh, of uh, circumventing having an open bridge uh, on, on a waterway. Initially, it involved taking, uh, they, they would put wires on both sides of the banks, two parallel wires about the width of the vehicle, they would take the uh, tires off the vehicle rest the vehicle, um, the vehicle rims on the tires, and then use a pulley to push the vehicle across the river to the other side. As you can imagine, that was a very time-consuming process. And the fact that we had aerial observers out looking for these crossing opportunities, and we, we couldn't see the, uh, you know, with those wires uh, from the air. But uh, they came up with other ways, too, that were, were very effective. They uh, came up with something called a uh, a buoy bridge, and um, what they would do is they got thousands of truck inner tubes interconnected and put a bridge platform on it and sunk it in the water uh, in a river. At night, they had uh, air pumps on either bank. They would turn on the air pumps, and out of the water would emerge a floating bridge platform, uh, and they would use that bridge platform to run manning material over the bridge. And just before daybreak, they would turn off the air pumps, 
inflate the tires and sink back beneath the water. So a very clever way of disguising how they were able to uh, not cross over the, uh, the riverways. I asked them how long their tours were on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And their response was, our service was terminated only upon death, near death, and victory. And again, uh, when you look back at our tour, it's been 12 to 13 months. Uh, that's quite a commitment by, by the Chinese people. The, uh, I spoke to a number of veterans who were involved in, in search party efforts after the war to locate bodies along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, uh, they shared this story. They said, quote, there was a sense among these soldiers they were not alone as they searched for their comrades' remains. On more than one occasion, it was reported a truck broke down for no apparent reason. As the driver worked to repair it, the fight off the problem, while his other soldiers set out in search of food, unexpectedly stumbled upon a burial site while doing so. Soon after, the soldiers returned to the truck to report their discovery, and just as inexplicably as the vehicle's engine had been, started up again. As engine breakdowns would occur, soldiers thus learned to always to initiate a search of the surrounding area for additional possible burial sites. Some Vietnamese families have even turned to psychics to help them locate the remains of loved ones along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. A number of them have been uh, successful. Another area that uh, was fascinating to me was the uh, use of tunnels and, uh, Vietnam. and uh, the Vietnamese had, had initially learned to use tunnels while fighting the French and it never reached the complexity level that it did during the war with the United States. It's estimated that their tunnel network uh, in and around Saigon was probably about 350 meters and they had everything under them. They had meeting rooms, they had living areas, they had armories. Uh, they even came up with a clever way when they had fires on the ground you know, to, to cook meals of dissipating the smoke so that it never would come up through a, a hole. Uh, and you'd see a puff of smoke and you'd be able to realize that there was a, uh, uh, a tunnel system in there. The, uh, <coughs> The first time we realized they, had, they were using tunnels was uh, 1966 in Operation Crim. And this was called a hand, hammer and anvil operation. The Saigon River was the, the anvil, and we had uh, Navy boats along the river. And Army and Marine Forces then swept two of this area and uh, towards the river, hoping to, to you know, stir up any uh, Viet Cong that were in that. Uh, that area. They came all the way through, reached the river, never encountered a single Viet Cong. Turned around, started going back. All of a sudden, they're taken under fire. And they saw something pop up from the ground and pop back in. They ran over to try and find where he had hidden himself. They had a hard time even finding the entryway to the, uh, the tunnel. They had camouflaged them so well. But we learned that they had built extensive tunnel networks uh, that they were, they were able to, to use. And, uh, they used it in an offensive capability to fire at us, and then as we close in on that position, you know, they'd go over to another exit and fire at us from that position. They were so well camouflaged <clears throat> that in some cases, when defensive positions were set up, lo and behold, one would pop up in the middle of the defensive position. I, I went back uh, in the 70s when I was researching my book and had an opportunity to uh, they preserve some of the trail uh, for tourists. And uh, uh, they challenged me to find the entryway to the uh, tunnel. Walked around, couldn't find it. And so I, I'll give you a hint. It's within five feet of me. And again, I looked around. I, I just couldn't find anything. All of a sudden, this pops up. Uh, they, they were that well hidden, uh, and, and it mixed in with the, uh, the, uh, the leaves and everything on the, on the ground, so we had no idea where that entry was. The, uh, it became kind of a, a chess match with, uh, dealing with the, with the uh, tunnel system. Uh, 
initially they, we found they were, they were digging about six feet underground. And we would use tanks to drive uh, over and over the, the tunnel system, and pretty soon the heavy weight would cause the tunnel to collapse. But then they learned to dig them deeply, and the soil over there was clay, so uh, it was uh, you know, pretty, pretty hard to knock down. They, uh, we then started using, uh, if we were near a river, we would put a hose uh, from the river into the, the entryway of the tunnel and flood flooding them out. Another thing we did was use tear gas. We'd uh, find an entry point, we'd throw a, a tear, gas, tear gas grenade down there and, uh, and try to spook them out that way. They came up with a very clever way of uh, getting around that. What they would do is they would dig uh, a tunnel like this and then dig what I would call a U-drain. It would come like this and then start the tunnel again. And in that U-drain, they would fill it with water. And again, because it was clay, it, it would retain the water so that when we put tear gas in, tear gas couldn't uh, penetrate the water. So they would simply take a breath, go uh, through the U-drain and come up on the other side. The, uh, another way they dealt with the, uh, the tear gas, I was interviewing one gentleman, he said they were, they were taught when the tear gas was thrown down there if you didn't have that U-drain escape to urinate on a handkerchief and put it over your nose and mouth and breathe through that. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, that uh, it wasn't as bad that way. And he said, believe me, when you guys threw the tear gas down there, we didn't have any trouble urinating. <laughs> I, uh, here, I asked to interview the commanding officer of the uh, Kuchi Tunnel Fighters. We had about a two-day interview with him. And, uh, and the main focus had been to learn how they had dug these tunnels and uh, uh, you know, the evolution of how they became so, uh, so large a system. Uh, on the second day, he started rattling off a list of targets. He said, we, uh, we attacked uh, this target, we attacked this target, we attacked the uh, Navy headquarters. And I stopped him and said, is that the Navy headquarters in Saka? And he looked at me and smiled and said, yes. And I said, that would have been 1969. He smiled said, yes. Turned out that this is the fellow that had masterminded an assassination attempt against my father when he commanded the naval forces in Vietnam. And so I had heard about the attack uh, from my father during the war, and uh, so I asked the colonel to give me more details on it. He uh, explained that uh, what your father didn't realize was that the cook they were using in his uh, headquarters was a spy for us, and uh, he told us about how every day your father at lunchtime would not uh, go to lunch, he would go out with the staff members and play volleyball. And what the cook did was uh, a couple of days before the attack, uh, there was a tall wall that surrounded the compound. He went out and put a mark on the wall where the volleyball was. And so uh, a few days later, the, uh, the colonel sent uh, two of his uh, uh, trusted assassins on a motorcycle. They came driving down the road next to the compound, saw the mark, the, the guy riding on the back of the motorcycle had a satchel charge and threw it over the, uh, the wall into the compound. There was an explosion and they took off. Fortunately, what happened five minutes before the, when the father and the staff was to, were, were looking to play volleyball, uh, the father had called by General Abrams to have a special meeting and so they had, all had to go over to uh, his headquarters for that meeting. But uh, uh, you know, just the coincidence of the timing, he, uh, he survived. Having that conversation, as you can imagine, sent chills down my spine. Uh, you know, I was sitting across the table from somebody who tried to kill my father. When the interview was over, he stood up and said, when you see your father next, give him my apologies. The time I was only doing my job as a soldier. I went home that evening to the hotel I was staying at and immediately called my father to share the experience with him. I finished up by saying, by the way, Dad, I gave him your new address. <laughs> my father had a great sense of humor. He, he had to. He had a son that went into the Marine Corps. The other thing I found fascinating about the tunnels is uh, the way they dealt these things. You know, you aren't talking about having heavy-duty equipment to dig these. You're talking about one man digging a dry well, putting dirt in a bucket that's pulled up by another man, 
It's given to a team of others who need to, to get rid of the dirt. And while he's doing that, parallel to that is another dry well being dug the same way. They would go to a certain depth, and then at that depth, the two diggers at the bottom would start digging towards each other, and they would you know, hopefully meet at the, uh, at the same place. And uh, you know, for not having any kind of equipment or compasses for the most part or anything else, they were effective, very effective at what they, they did. But it also raised the question, if you're digging a tunnel system that extensive, what's the problem? You've got all that excess dirt. You know, we can't just pile that up outside a hole because that would be a giveaway to us that uh, there must have been a tunnel system there. So they came up with very clever ways of uh, getting rid of the dirt. There, were, there was no shortage of B-52 craters, so they would start filling in B-52 craters. Uh, if they would, didn't have B-52 craters nearby, they would, and there was jungle uh, uh, nearby, they would spread it in the jungle. Sometimes they were in completely open areas, so they got some of their more uh, artistic uh, veterans to build termite mounds. Uh, you know, Vietnam had, had you know, lots of termites, and so it, it would not be surprising to see termite mounds. But I mean, this you see like a major city of termites uh, out uh, in a particular area, and again, we would fly over them and instantly think it was just termites, and it was really a way of disguising where the dirt was coming from. I also interviewed uh, civilian victims of the war. You know, during uh, World War II in Pearl Harbor, there were 20 sets of brothers who were lost uh, at Pearl Harbor. Many of you have probably heard the story about the Sullivan brothers, five brothers who were on a cruiser, who uh, the cruiser sank, and all five brothers were lost. Multiple losses in a single family for the Vietnamese was commonplace. We see me, a mother sent four sons off to war. Only one returned. Win T. Diem, a husband and two sons failed to return. Tron T. Trine, husband of five sons, failed to return. 1,400 mothers lost three or more sons. It, uh, as devastating as it is to lose a son when you have an entire generation of a family wiped out like that, it's uh, pretty devastating. When T. Trine saw the war claim nine children, son-in-law and one grandchild. Win T. Ron lost eight sons and two grandchildren. MIAs. I think now we're down to under 2,000 MIAs in Vietnam. Uh, I think at the highest point it was a little under 3,000. Vietnam, there are 300,000 MIAs. And remember, in their case, there was no way to get bodies back. They simply buried them in place, and that was it. 300,000. You put that on a percentage of the population, and I think it worked out at the time to one in 83 families being impacted by the loss of the, uh, an MIA. In our case, it was along the lines of about 10,000. But I also spoke to the search teams, our search teams that we had in Vietnam to get an idea of how that was going. And they were quick to acknowledge that whenever there was a report, you know, the Vietnamese government had 24 hours to allow the search team to get to that position to uh, determine the veracity of the report. They shared one example with me of a sighting that was made of a, uh, they said a dark-skinned American in chains with uh, guards going through the jungle. So they immediately reported it to the Vietnamese government. They were able to helicopter to the site. When they got there, they discovered that it was a, a chain gang of lumbermen 
and they were using the chains in the trade of cutting down trees and, and pulling them and so forth. So it turned out that it was a, a, a darker skinned Vietnamese fellow that uh, uh, was seen with these chains. And uh, so a, a report that uh, they put some initial hope in to uh, turn out to be uh, something else. There was a book I read before I, I went over to do my research on the war, and uh, it was called uh, Sorrow of the War. It was written by a North Vietnamese soldier who uh, uh, did a, an amazing job of uh, telling it like it was on the Vietnamese side of the battlefield. In fact, it was so realistic that uh, uh, Vietnamese government uh, later terminated his right to uh, publish the book. Um, the thing that was interesting was, as I read through his book, I got these insights that uh, reminded me of, of um, um, some of you heard of it, All Quiet on the Western Front. And uh, this was kind of Vietnamese equivalent of that. And I, I asked him what it was that uh, caused him to write this book. And uh, he said he and his unit were out on patrol. Uh, they set up an ambush and they uh, killed some Americans and Vietnamese. They went rifling through their backpacks. And he said he came across a book in English. I'll tell you that. I asked him what the name of the book was and he said it was all quiet on the Western Front. So I thought it was interesting that you know, when I read his book, that's what I immediately thought of, and that turned out to be the genesis for his book. The Chinese uh, strategist Sun Tzu over 2,000 years ago said you never engage an enemy unless you know that enemy. I think our biggest shortcoming in the Vietnam War was not knowing our enemy. And if you stop to think about it, the Vietnamese we fought had fought and defeated the Japanese, the French, the Americans, the Cambodians, the Chinese. I think what we failed to realize during the Vietnam War, while many of you who served in World War II are our greatest generation, I think what we failed to realize is that we were probably fighting Vietnam's greatest generation. And they were committed to victory at any price. Thank you, I'll take the questions. You're talking about the uh, tear gas. Thank you very Great Combs, you got questions about tear gas. I'm Greg Combs, served in Vietnam from April 67 through December of uh, 68. Was there during the Tet Offensive? I brought some things in for the museum display back here. And one on the in the display case, there's a Vietnamese or North Vietnamese gas mask. <laughs> When you look at it, it's like a, well, maybe a heavy-duty uh, garment bag with little square eye holes and plastic cut in, and inside a little thin piece of gauze. It's as thin as a pan. Well, it does not work. It's a, we all decided that it was something psychological for the men to have it. They were pretending, but they didn't work. And I didn't take the time to try to urinate it and see if it changed the system or anything. But, uh, Suffice to say that they did what they had. But we were talking about how ingenious they were in making things. In the back there was also pudgy stakes. <laughs> there was also pudgy stakes in there. And these are old enough that I think they were probably put in by the Viet Cong that were fighting the French because they were found on a hill called Hill 37. And my battalion was on that hill. Our battalion, 7th Marines, uh, with HNS and Kilo Company. And we were doing some work up around there, and I found a board with these in there. And they're actually, they appear to be forged punchy stakes. So there's some time put into these things to make them work. And uh, I, I mounted them to a board back there. Uh, 
There's an, also a, an M1 carbine pouch. Just made on material, sewn, big enough to fit on the gun belt. And they have little, little white buttons. Buttons here. <laughs> anyway, uh, they had uh, a canteen, Chinese canteen, that had been uh, holes put in a shrapnel hole or something. And they were able to take some plastic and melt it over the hole and just fill it in and all. So when you look at all this stuff, this is not stuff like we had in this manufactured companies and send it back and didn't work. These guys actually made their own stuff. And when you start to look at that, these people are dedicated. They're not going to quit. And uh, I want to marvel at those folks and how they do that. Just an experience. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your service and also for sharing that. Uh, most of the punchy sticks that they used over there were made out of bamboo. They would sharpen the, the bamboo. And then what they would do is take uh, uh, cow manure and put that on the top of the, uh, the spikes so that not only would you get jabbed by this thing, but it would cause an infection uh, as well. So uh, they, were, they were pretty barbaric. And, uh, as far as some of the weapons they came up with. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention was uh, we had a, a group of uh, uh, Marines called uh, the Tunnel Rats. And these were fellows more on the small side that uh, were able to get into some of these tunnels because we needed to, to see what was down there. We did, never knew if we would come, come across documentation or something else that uh, would be helpful to the intelligence people. And uh, inevitably, these guys, uh, and my hat's off to them, they, uh, they would encounter uh, you know, some of these punji stakes. You, you didn't see it falling in, all of a sudden you'd fall down and uh, fall on these punji stakes. They put snakes in there, they uh, put uh, uh, all kinds of uh, different uh, traps. They had a, a trap door that was visible, you'd open it, and an explosive would go off. So uh, the, these guys are an amazing group of guys. And I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just humbled by the job they were able to do. Sadly, we lost a number of them, as you can imagine. And in some cases, we couldn't even retrieve the bodies because they were, they were so far underground. But, uh, uh, they were an amazing group.